I actually just got back from the first Gross National Happiness USA conference, and I was surprised you weren't there because it's about your. But we'll, we'll talk. What I want to do is talk a little bit about you as an entrepreneur, and then move into the sort of core values of Zappos and where you fit in this positive psychology, conscious capitalism movement that's going on. So good. But the first thing I wanted to ask you was how many pairs of shoes you have. I'm not a shoe person at all. So I used to uh, buy one pair of shoes, wear them for two years until there were holes in them, and then buy the same pair again. But I now own five pairs of shoes. So that's a 500% improvement. And are they all the same? Do you, uh, you like? Pretty much. Well, I have running shoes. These are uh, Donald J. Pliner. Really, for me, it's I travel a lot, so I try to buy shoes without laces. Smart. <laughs> I wanted to talk first about the worms and how that helps you become an entrepreneur. Because I find in talking to people, I don't have a shred of entrepreneurial syrup, uh, spirit in me. But you seem to have it from very, very young. Yeah, I guess um, you know, my, my parents came from Taiwan, and I'm first generation born in the US. And I think it's pretty common for uh, people under the, the, raised under those circumstances to do what my parents did, which was basically they had my whole life mapped out for me from when I was born. They wanted me to get good grades in school to, and play all these musical instruments so that I could get into college and then the point of going to college was to get into grad school or med school and the point of doing that was so that they could see an MD or a PhD at the end of my <laughs> title. And so for me, I guess being an entrepreneurial from as a kid growing up was my way of rebelling against them because I didn't really want to go have my whole life planned out for me. And so with, with Worms, uh, you know, the, the book starts out with the story of how basically I had these plans to just grow a lot of earthworms and then sell them to, I'm not even sure who buys earthworms, but <laughs> I, 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 I thought I would sell a lot of them. Uh, anyways, it, it didn't work out. And I, I, think, I think part of the reason for writing the book is because from the outside, you know, Zappos may seem like an overnight success, but the truth is we made a lot of mistakes along the way. And then prior to Zappos, I made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot of lessons along the way. And so part of it is to not only help other business owners and entrepreneurs uh, hopefully not make some of the same mistakes, but also you know, to really s spread the message that part of the whole entrepreneurial spirit is about not feeling failures as uh, I think a lot of people, if they fail at something, then end up labeling themselves as a failure. But rather, that's just part of the necessary path to go get to where you're going to end up. And uh, as long as you learn from each of those opportunities, and every entrepreneur, every business has their ups and downs and, you know, and failures and, and then some successes along the way. Uh, but you have to go through that process. You can't just expect, oh, you, know, you go through and everything's going to be great. And, uh, I think there are very few uh, entrepreneurs who succeed the first time. And that's also, that's the message we get in the media is here's a guy who sold his company for a billion dollars, now your book is bestseller list, uh, top of the New York Times bestseller list, second week in a row, but no one sees the struggle, and you're very frank in this book about the struggles you went. Can we talk a little bit before we get to Zappos about link exchange, because I learned a lot reading about how you just the, the process of selling Link Exchange and, and all the decisions you made yeah. there. Uh, yeah, so Link Exchange, uh, this was back in 1996 during the first internet uh, you know, dot com craziness and online advertising. And a roommate from college and I started out of our apartment. And it was a lot of fun when it was just five or 10 of us. I remember we were sleeping under our desks, working around the clock, had no idea what day of the week it was. And, uh, as we were growing, it was exciting, and we had friends that would drive across the country, and uh, and then we needed help, so they would stay, and then they actually never made it back home, and 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 we started hiring more and more of our friends uh, up to when we were, uh, I think that took us to 15 or 20 people, uh, but then eventually we ran out of friends, and so <laughs> we we didn't know any better to pay attention to company culture, so we hired people that had all the right skill sets and experiences, but uh, not all of them were great for the culture. And slowly, little by little, uh, the culture 
started going downhill, and we just didn't know any better you know, to pay attention to it. So by the time we got to 100 people, I myself dreaded getting out of bed in the morning, and that was kind of a strange feeling because this was a company I had co-founded. And so that's really what led us to sell the company to, to Microsoft two and a half years later. And with Zappos, wanted to make sure that we didn't make the same mistake again. So uh, today, culture is actually our number one priority in the, in the company. And our whole belief is if we get the culture right, then not only will it be an enjoyable place to work, but uh, most of the other stuff, like delivering great customer service or building a long-term enduring brand, will just happen naturally on its own. So that, that was sort of the core takeaway of Link Exchange, that experience. Yeah, and, and so, yes, it was great financially, but it was actually pretty, pretty sad in, internally just because we kind of lost control of, of the culture. And it, but then, you know, it's one of those things where going back to the whole, uh, you know, fail, fail, not viewing failures as a label on your yourself, like, yes, it was sad at the time that we lost control of the culture, but if that hadn't happened and we just had a, say, okay culture or decent culture, uh, then we would never have emphasized culture as much at, at Zappos. And so, you know, we, we set as an early goal to make the Fortune 100 best companies to work for us, which we were actually super excited to make the last two years in a row. Uh, and I don't think that would have happened if the Link Exchange experience hadn't happened. You sold the company, it was $265 million after deflecting other suitors, and you walked away from another, an even bigger payout because you were so unhappy with the culture, too. I thought that was an interesting lesson, that you were so resolved not to stay in a bad situation that you gave up. Am I remembering that yeah. correctly? Well, I, yeah, so they had, uh, you know, I guess they call them golden handcuffs to keep me there. Uh, longer for at least another year and I just felt like I would, that would be another year of my life that was you know being wasted and and so I walked away from it and it wasn't worth millions of dollars to you which was very brave I I think I mean um, I, I don't know I, I think if you actually you know beyond a certain point like there's if you make a list of all the things you actually want to buy it's it's uh, how much <laughs> money like like you I don't know it, it, it's yeah. So, um, <laughs> and I list in my in in the book the thing like I wanted a big screen TV and um, you know there aren't big screen TVs that cost ten million dollars. Right. So, so 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 yeah. So so I wasn't. Um, and for me, I've always really valued experiences much more than things. So uh, yeah, I don't have a. I drive a Mazda six, which. I think is a cool car, but everyone else thinks it's weird I drive a, a Mazda 6, I don't know why. Um, but anyway, so, so for me it's really just more about, you know, I really enjoy the idea of building s stuff. And so even after Link Exchange, I spent a year with Alfred, who's our CFO today, when we invested in a whole bunch of different internet companies, and Zappos just happened to be one of them. And during that one year, I realized that for me, in investing was pretty boring. I, you know, even though it's about making money, I realized that that's not what uh, excited me. I, I felt like I was sitting on the sidelines and uh, really want to be part of building something. And so that's out of all the investments we made, Zappos was the most fun and promising. So I ended up joining Zappos full time within a year. I thought that was interesting, too, that you, it almost didn't matter what Zappos did. It just seemed like you saw promise in it and invested in it. It was a good petri dish for these emerging values for yeah, you. And, I mean, I think it ultimately just came down to the people. And we, you know, the problem that we had at Link Exchange was, uh, and the reason it became less fun was because this group of people, we were forced to work together, uh, and they were people that, a lot of them were people that I wouldn't choose to normally be around, but because we were in business, we had to be around each other. And so um, with Zappos, a big part of the draw was these were, peop these were people that I would choose to be, hang out with, be around, even if uh, we weren't in business together. And so that's kind of state, that's, that's what uh, led us to the strong culture today. Like when, that's probably one of the most important things when we hire people, especially senior level people, is this is someone I would choose to be around if 
we weren't working together. Mm -hmm. And that's a big criteria. And so uh, for us, it really just comes, it's much easier to control the culture if you just focus a lot on the hiring process. So we actually do two sets of interviews. The hiring manager and his or her team will interview for this standard, you know, fit within the team, relevant experience, technical ability, and so on. But then our HR department does a separate set of interviews purely for culture fit, and they have to pass both in order to be hired. So we've actually passed on a lot of really smart, talented people that we know can make an immediate impact on our top or bottom line, but if they're not a culture fit, we'll, we won't hire them. And the reverse is true, too. Even if someone is doing their job function perfectly fine, they could be a superstar. If they're bad for the culture, that alone is something we'll, we'll fire for. And um, our performance reviews are 50% based on whether they're living or inspiring the culture in others, which we formalize into uh, 10 core values, which I think you have. Yeah, let's, let's have look at them. Slide on. Um, there they are. So, yeah, so, so we have 10 core values. And um, a lot of companies have, they might call them, especially bigger corporations, have things called core values or guiding principles or, or so on. But the problem is usually they're very lofty sounding and they read kind of like a press release that the marketing department put out and a lot of them sound the exact same <laughs> as their competitors. Yes. Um, and we wanted to come up with uh, not just core values but committable core values. And by committable meaning that we're willing to hire or fire people based on whether they're living up to those values or not. And when you use that criteria, that's actually a pretty hard list to come up with. So what, what is your list of, uh, you know, for, for company just to think about what is your list of values where even if someone's a superstar in their job that you're willing to fire, fire them on. And so we actually spent a year, um, this was, we actually didn't always have core values. And actually if I could do it all over again, uh, I, would, I wish we had it from day one. But we didn't have it till I think five years into it or so. And I sent an email out to the entire company and asked our employees, what should our core values be? And got a whole bunch of different responses back and went back and forth. And over the course of a year, eventually came up with uh, these lists of 10. So when we interview people, oh, and then the other t tests that we uh, think for, would be good for anyone here you know, to think about values for their company is uh, you know, if you cover up if you cover up the word Zappos, you can still tell from the list of values that it's Zappos. And in fact, if you do a Google search for any one of these values, uh, on almost all of them will show up on the first page. And actually, I think eight of them we show up as a number one search result. Whereas, go look up, do a Google search for uh, any other company's values. And you know, it's usually hard to even find where, where that company will show up. So um, yeah, we have interview questions for each and every one of these core values. And uh, the one that probably trips us up the most in the hiring process is the last one, be humble, because there's a lot of smart, talented people that are also <laughs> egotistical. And for us, it's not even a question. We won't hire them. Uh, but f you know, at a lot of other companies, the conversation afterwards might be, well, this person is kind of annoying sometimes, might rub you the wrong way, but he's going to add a lot of value to the company, and therefore, we should hire him. And that one hire may or may not bring the company culture downhill, but I think if you keep making compromises like that over and over and over again, that's why most large companies don't have great cultures. Um, yeah. Although, I guess for number 10, that's actually probably the hardest one to actually have a question for, because you can't say how humble are you, and they say, I'm the most humble person <laughs> in the world. So, um, but uh, one way we actually test this is um, we, uh, so we're based out of Las Vegas. We offer tours to the public. If you go to, next time any of you are in Las Vegas, just go to tours.zappos.com and we'll pick you up in a Zappos shuttle, give you a tour, it takes about an hour, and then drop you off at your hotel afterwards. So for a lot of our candidates, they're from out of town. And we do the same thing. We pick them up in a Zappos shuttle, uh, give them a tour, and then afterwards they spend the day interviewing. But then at the end of the day interviewing, we, uh, the recruiter, circles back to the shuttle driver and asks how they were treated and if you know they were if they weren't treated well it doesn't matter how well that day of interviews when we won't hire them it's not even a question it's the old waitress on a date kind of test yeah. right somebody mistreats a waitress on a date you don't go out with them again do you have a hard time finding people given that i mean given how rigid you are understandably is it is it 50-50? Um, no, I mean, I think over time, it's, uh, 
kind of word of mouth has gotten, and it's definitely helped, uh, you know, making the Fortune 100 best companies to work for list, because then that, Attracts. between that and the, and the word of mouth amongst uh, employees, and, and as in Vegas, there's lots of other call centers, and so there's a lot of local word of mouth there as well. Uh, last year, we had about 25,000 people apply, and we only offered job, I only hired 1% of them. So, uh, so part of the challenge is actually sifting through uh, the different job applications. Um, and so I, I'll give some examples of other interview questions we have for the third one. Uh, yep, create fun and a little weirdness. Uh, one of our interview questions is, on a scale one to 10, how weird are you? And, uh, <laughs> you know, one, you might be a little bit too straight-laced for us. Ten, you might be a little bit too psychotic for us. But um, <laughs> it's not actually some, what the actual number is, but how, seeing how people respond to that. Uh, for our belief is that everyone's a little weird somehow. And so this is really more just a fun way of saying that we really recognize and celebrate each person's individuality. And we want their true personalities to shine in the workplace, whether it's interacting with each other or with customers. And, you know, there's so many people in corporate America where they're a different person in the office versus at home, and they leave a little bit of themselves, or in a lot of cases, a big part of themselves at home right. when they go to work. And we want the employee to be comfortable being the same person, because once people, are, what we found is once employees are comfortable being themselves, then that's when the ideas come out. That's when uh, creativity uh, shines, and that's uh, when they end up being really engaged and can make tr true friendships with, their, with the people they work with, not just have coworker relationships. And it's also cool because then over the phone, uh, when customers call, you know, we run our call center very differently from most call centers. We don't have scripts. We don't have, um, we're, we're not trying to get the customer off the phone in the name of efficiency. In fact, our longest phone call was almost six hours long. Um, and. Uh, and then we don't try to upsell and, and, and so on. And so uh, if you call once, you might get a uh, rep that loves telling jokes and you know, it's making you laugh and that's great. And, and then you might call a second time and get someone that's not a joke teller, but say they hear your dog barking in the background and if they also have a dog, then the two of you can bond over dogness or whatever <laughs> dog we talk about. Um, so, so anyways, that's... That's, and then uh, for number, core value number four uh, is about being uh, creative, ad adventurous, and open-minded. And one of the questions we ask for that is on a scale one to 10, how lucky are you in life? One is, mm. I don't know why bad things always seem to happen to me. And 10 is, I don't know why good things always seem to happen to me. Uh, we don't want to hire the ones because they're bad luck and we don't want bad luck to <laughs> come to Zappos. But this was actually um, inspired by an actual study that I read about a few years earlier where they asked, they asked that exact same question to a random group of people, so they got all sorts of different answers. And then afterwards, they had them do a task. And the task was to go through a newspaper and count the number of photos that were in that newspaper. And what the participants didn't know was that it was actually a fake newspaper. And sprinkled throughout the newspaper were these headlines that would say things like, if you're reading this now, you can <clears throat> Excuse me. You can stop, and the you know the answer is thirty-seven um, <laughs> plus collect an extra hundred dollars. And what they found was the people that consider themselves unlucky in life generally never noticed the headlines. They just went through the task at hand and eventually uh, you know came up with the right answer. But then the people that consider themselves lucky in life generally stopped early and made an extra hundred dollars. So the takeaway is that it's not so much that people are inherently lucky or unlucky in life, but that luck is really more about being open to opportunity beyond just how the task or situation presents itself. So that's why we ask that question for core value number four. I, I want to, there's so much to talk about, but since you're talking about this, can we talk a little bit about positive psychology for a minute? Because that's got a lot to do, an outlook on life has a lot to do with how you must be hiring people and how you yourself have conducted your life so far? Well, I don't know if everyone in the audience knows what positive psychology yeah, is, but I'll, I'll explain. Um, so prior, it's essentially the science of happiness. So it's not about going to the self-help section of the bookstore and there's 
and getting a book that says, think positive and you'll be happy. Um, but it's actually based on actual research that's been done. And prior to 1998, most of psychology was about looking at people that had something wrong with them and trying to figure out how to make them more normal. But almost nobody bothered to study how to take normal people and make them happier until 1998. And so there's been, uh, this was something that just a couple years ago I started just personally being interested in. And at first it had nothing to do with Zappos. It was more, I just thought the articles were interesting. So I re started reading articles and books and so on. And one of the uh, pretty consistent things that the research has shown is that people are actually very bad at predicting what will make them happy uh, on a sustained basis. Most people think, oh, once I get X, then I'll be happy, or once I achieve X, then, then I'll be happy. And the research shows that's just not true. Not true. You know, there's, so many, there's studies of lottery winners, for example. You look at their happiness level right before winning the lottery and look at their happiness level a year later. A year later, it's the same or maybe even a little bit lower than what it was before. And the opposite is true, too, though. Like people that, for example, suddenly become blind, uh, if you look at them a year later, their happiness level is about the same as where it was before they unexpectedly became, got, became blind. So I thought that was interesting in thinking about how it relates to you know, not only myself personally, but to business as well. You, know, you, you can't just ask customers necessarily or ask employees what can we, you know, if we're striving to be a great company to work for, you can't just ask employees, what can we do to make you happy? Because just based on the research, the answers aren't always, uh, aren't always true. And, and one of the places where we found that to be true is raises, for example. Um, like a raise is only a raise for a month, and then after that, it's just your pay. And so, uh, you know, it, there, there is, you know, definitely when you get a raise, you're happy, but then at some, you know, it, the, out. yeah, the happiness you get from it goes back down relatively quickly. So, um, so there's a, in, in the book, I talk about a few different frameworks that are, that I, that I thought were interesting through, um, through reading the articles. And so one of the frameworks was that happiness is, um, from the research is really just about four things, uh, perceived control, perceived progress, uh, connectedness, meaning the number and depth of your relationships, and uh, being part of something bigger than yourself. And so what's interesting is you can actually apply that to, um, to business as well. And so, for example, for perceived progress, uh, we used to hire people entry level in our merchandising d team, and then uh, they go through training and certification, so on, get a promotion 18 months later, and then get more training, certification, and then uh, get another promotion 18 months after that. So total time, three years to become a buyer at Zappos, which is uh, kind of a big thing at, in our company. And so uh, a few years ago, we changed it so that instead of a big promotion every 18 months, we gave them smaller promotions every six months. And they still had to go through the exact same training and certification, and it still took exactly three years to become a buyer. So nothing had actually changed, but we found employees were much happier because there was that ongoing sense of progress and it didn't cost us anything and, uh, and yeah, and so employees are happier. And I was actually talking with um, a friend yesterday and thinking, you know, Apple, how many people here own an iPhone or iPad or, so, so anyway, I, I got my first iPhone, I guess, six or nine months ago, but um, in, in a lot of ways, Apple does, the same thing where like just thinking back the first generation iPhone didn't have copy and paste like I think they did that on purpose but you know just so that the second generation oh now copy and paste is so exciting and I'm so happy they whoever did whoever says that <laughs> and, or you know and then and and I think the next one has you know two cameras or whatever but but like you know they're I I don't know I'm not part of Apple but um, it seems like they're slowly you know purposely just letting out additional features and drips and drabs instead of just building the perfect iPhone. And, and then people get excited about this ongoing sense of progress. It makes you fall in love with it more and more. Everything you say in this book and with the values, everything I've read, it makes so much sense. It looks so much fun when you look at the videos online of the people you work with. Why is it so hard for everyone else to be like Apple with its products or you with your Core um, I think it's, uh, I mean, I think a big part of it is because the payoff 
for investments, whether it's in customer service or in culture, is usually at least two or three years down the line. And there's so many companies that are focused on how do we maximize profits this quarter or this year. And if our only goal was to maximize 2010 profits, then the right thing to do would be to shut down our call center, fire everyone. Uh, and I don't think it would actually affect our revenues at all for this year. Uh, and it would definitely increase our profits for 2010. But then we'd start hurting, I think, two or three years down the line. And you know, we, because we've always made ongoing investments into the customer experience and into culture, uh, you know, during the whole, you know, the past 24 months have been pretty tough in general in, from, in terms of the economy, but we actually never stopped growing. And in fact, um, Q1 of this year, we were up almost 50% uh, versus Q1 of the previous year. And I think that's really because of investments. You know, people ask us, how do we do that? But it's because of the investments we made two or three years prior to the whole economy going downhill. And so our customers remain super loyal to us. Our employees are uh, you know, super loyal and, and, and engaged. And, and, and it's really, you know, ultimately, business is about balancing the short, medium, and long-term uh, needs. And so and, and it's also just not a um, feel good thing. It, it actually, so uh, you know, there's books like Good to Great by Jim Collins and Tribal Leadership, right. uh, which actually we partnered with the authors on Tribal Leadership. And you can download the audio for free from the Zappos website. But what I, so we actually teach classes on these two books to our employees. And we offer them in our lobby for free to visitors and, and employees. But the reason why I really think those two books are important is because the authors researched and looked at what separated the great companies in terms of long-term financial per performance from just the good ones. And they were actually surprised by the findings, because it wasn't what they were expecting. And they found that the great companies had two important ingredients that the good ones or mediocre ones generally did not. And the first ingredient was strong culture. And the second ingredient was that the great companies all had a higher purpose beyond just money or profits or being number one in the market. So kind of the irony there is that by not making profits or being number one in market your top priority, it actually ends up generating more profits in the long term. So. But again, it just seems like why isn't everybody buying into I think that? It's just because it's in the long term. Right. Do you worry about the Amazon? Obviously, we don't worry too much about the Amazon marriage right now. But um, what do you, what do you think will happen down the road? I know you can't really say for sure. Yeah, but well, so as a precondition, and then for those that don't know, we announced last July that Amazon was acquiring Zappos, and then the transaction officially closed in November of last year. But as a precondition for uh, even talking about exploring that scenario, we told them we would only explore that if we could remain independent and continue to grow the Zappos brand and our culture and you know, our way of doing business and our, our way. And so basically, it's as if we swapped out our previous board of directors with a new one. And so instead of flying to San Francisco once a quarter for board meetings, we now fly to Seattle once a quarter. And they've remained true to their word. In fact, we even have a document that's called, the five, we internally call it the five tenets uh, document and it explicitly states in there that uh, Amazon recognizes that Zappos culture is what's gotten us to where we are today and they will seek to protect that and another one of the tenets is that basically unless it's legally required we make our own decisions and and actually it's already been uh, come up a few times where we make the complete opposite decision from the rest of Amazon which uh, so, so yeah, they've remained true to their word. And, and, and it's actually, in a lot of ways, we actually have more freedom than we did before. Because before, we had purely financial uh, investors on our board. And so we had to worry a lot more about making the quarterly or yearly numbers. Whereas Amazon's very similar to Zappos in terms of being really long-term focused and really customer focused. We just approach uh, what makes for a good customer experience in different ways. They're more about, uh, they state selection, convenience, and low prices, whereas we're really, um, and, and they try to reduce their prices by really investing a lot in technology and automation and so on, whereas 
we take a, a very human personal approach you know through the phones and, and so on so uh, their approach is more high tech and we're more high touch and but we both think long term in terms of what's best for the customer when you talk about higher purpose for you that's your commitment seems to be in helping other entrepreneurs other businesses understand what you've come to understand and are learning all the time about delivering happiness. Can you talk a little bit about that as opposed to your committing to give away a percent of your profits or setting up a Google foundation or a foundation like Google did? I, I, th I think maybe 50 years ago, companies, yeah, they had felt like they had to choose between maximizing profits and making uh, employees happy or making customers happy. And I think we're living in a special time uh, and actually, I think we're just at the beginning of, of this, where because everyone's hyper-connected and information travels so quickly through Twitter, blogs, Facebook, and, and so on, that it's actually possible to have it all make customers happy, make employees happy, uh, and still drive profits and, and growth. And so that is a big part of the reason for writing the book. And it's been, it's been really cool just already getting feedback from companies that have either, uh, we have a, another program called Zappos Insights. Uh, there's a separate website, zapposinsights.com, where it, it's a lot of the same. We help other entrepreneurs and businesses figure out their own core values that are right for them and build their own strong cultures. So through that and through people that have read advanced copies of the book, we're already hearing back stories of other companies in completely different industries that are going back and focusing on customer service, focusing on company culture. And, there's um, the Atlanta Refrigeration Company, for example, based in Atlanta. They do refrigeration repairs out in the field. So you can't, in some ways, think of a more opposite company or industry than Zappos. Because, and, and they went back and it's, and then sent us like before and after pictures of their offices and uh, really focused on culture. And, and their employees are happier, their customers are happier, and their revenues and profits are up. Or uh, there's a bar in downtown Austin where they decided to a couple years ago really focus on culture and you know bar environment is probably the last place anyone would even think of company culture and now they're one of the top performing bars in downtown Austin so it's just really cool hearing these stories back and seeing that it's working for other industries other companies and it's not just a Zappos thing it's not just an internet company thing but do you, do you see yourself com you're going to go on this uh, what is it, 15 city tour, Jen was uh, telling me? Oh yeah, so oh. We're, we're having a, yeah, starting about a month from now, we're, we're getting a tour bus and wrapping it and uh, yeah, going, I actually don't know how many cities, but a lot of cities to, as part book tour, part, uh, you know, just helping spread this message. Spread the message, but do you, do you see yourself eventually stepping into a more philanthropic I, I guess it's something, it's right now, uh, I think what our mission is, is really to spread this idea of happiness in, in the workplace uh, to other companies beyond just Zappos. And we'll kind of see what makes sense as, as time goes on. Um, you know, in the process, we, we've actually partnered pretty, uh, pretty closely with Livestrong, and so uh, we we launched the book together, and, and as part of, um, I don't think we're actually doing it here today, but at most of the other book signings, we've uh, actually asked for Livestrong donations in, in exchange for, for book signings, and just in the past, uh, I'd say, month or so, raised $50,000 through, through, through just that. Um, but I, I guess, you know, going back to whether donation, to charities makes sense. I, I think that's a t that's a tough question because I'm not necessarily sure that that um, you know you can either give money to other organizations and then have them try to make the most use out of the money, or you can use that money, leverage that money to uh, affect more change within um, within your organization, and so. Like hypothetically, if um, you know, in reading through the book, you, if, if hypothetically, if after Link Exchange, all the money had been donated to charity, then 
Zappos no, wouldn't be it. around where it is today. So it's just, I, I think f for me, it's more of a question of timing. And so I think I'm at a stage in my life where I think the, it can, more, more can be done within, whether it's within Zappos or within you know, the, the book, which is actually a separate LLC from, from Zappos, and, and using you know, that to, to grow and then, you know, who knows what will happen 20 or 30 years from now. Jeffrey Hollander of Seventh Generation, who will be here speaking at the forum sometime next year, he was saying at this conference I was just at how a lot of companies give money away and don't necessarily sort of speak, you know, speak the walk the walk, so. You know, there are very few, um, I guess, philanthropic organizations that are you know that scale well, uh, and and so yeah. So so and, and same with uh, say government as as well. Right. So so it really um, what's tough about I think most charitable organizations is their way of getting bigger or better is get get more donations, uh, whereas in the for profit business world. <coughs> They really look at how do you increase efficiencies and 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 really keep improving your operations on a day to day basis. And I think um, there's a lot of inefficiencies in probably most nonprofit and charitable organizations. So the question is, uh, I, I guess for me in in today's world, it, it seems like you can accomplish more using for profit as a vehicle to achieve whatever the high, higher purpose is than you can through Nonprofits and by allowing people to work their best at their work, which is what we all have to do every day, it seems like that—that's your commitment, which is great. I—I I guess we're ready to start taking questions. Oh, we've got five more minutes. Um, do you know about the three good things exercise mm -mm. in positive psychology? May I share that really briefly? Because that's a big precept of. Uh, positive psychology, it's three good things every day or every night before you go to sleep. You make a list of the three good things that happened to you that day, even if you had the worst possible day. I found that when I was studying positive, or starting to look into positive psychology, very helpful. Are there other things that you've learned? You, you talk about a, a rave experience that you had where you had pure joy and... Yeah, well, going, going back to the three good things, so I've, I've read about it in terms of um, you know, basically building gratitude into your your daily life because so much, you know, goes on and it, it really just depends on, it, it forces you to focus on the good things, on, on the good things or, or at least reframing certain things. And so um, what, part of what I do, like I don't explicitly do that, but uh, Twitter actually has been a great way to, to, to do that because uh, anytime something Funny happens, or you know, there's a weird. Uh, like in San Francisco, I, there was this guy walking around with a uh, dog that had on top of it a cat that had on top of it a mouse, and he was just walking around. And, and it's weird stuff, right? So, um, and it's one of those things where uh, you know, normally you'd walking and be like, oh, that's weird, and then just, you know, <laughs> but because of Twitter, it ended up taking a picture and then tweeting. Out that picture, and you know, that just kind of forces you to you know, pause and appreciate the humor or, or weirdness of it. And so, uh, and, and same thing, just in general, like because of Twitter, and um, and then when I send out tweets, I go by uh, I call it the IC philosophy, I C E E, which stands for uh, I, I each and every one of my tweets. I try to have it either. Uh, fall into one of these four categories, at least one of these four categories, which are um, inspire, connect, educate, or entertain. And so anytime some, I see something weird or notice someone laughing uh, at, at some situation or joke, or, um, or if there's a, even a bad situation, what would normally be perceived as a bad or annoying situation, uh, if, if you think about it in the context of what, what would make a, Make, what can you tweet out that would make it, you know, entertaining or funny? Then, um, you know, that kind of forces you to reframe life in, because you're trying to tweet out stuff. So, so I've actually found that having, 
you know, using Twitter actually is kind of like the equivalent of doing that, but it mm -hmm. just note, you know, you note instead of just laughing at something and then forgetting about that uh, a minute later, you actually have to kind of focus on it and think about how do you describe that in 140 characters or less, and then uh, it, it ends up being something you spend you know, a few minutes on instead of just a few seconds on. It's about reframing the way you think, yeah. You are a CEO without an office. You're a cubicle person yourself. That, can you describe the work culture for you every day as the person in yeah. charge? Well, yeah, yeah, it wasn't really like I woke up one day and said, I'm moving out of my office. I just never had an office in the first place. So um, for us, it really wasn't that weird because when there was you know, five of us, we're not going right. to be in five offices. <laughs> and, and so just as we added more people, we just added more, more desks. And, I guess for us, the um, you know we want an open door policy, and the easiest way to have an open door policy is just to not have a door in the first place. So you're as accessible in the office as you are to people who can follow you or do follow you on Twitter, and yeah, and, and also you get to overhear a lot of phone conversations, and so kind of get a good sense of the vibe of the office that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you, you're on the floor, where, not where the call center is? or uh, The call center is on the second floor, and then I'm actually amongst the merchandising team, which is on the first floor. Real briefly, there, can you tell the story about the, I don't know, the pizza or the flour ordering story? There are two great customer service stories that I've seen. I mean, you have lots of great customer mm -hmm. service stories, but two really extreme versions. We can. Yeah, or we can tell both. both. Yeah, we've got plenty. No, no, well. I, yeah. I leave it we'll to tell, you. We'll tell. We'll leave it to the audience. Yeah. Who wants the pizza story? Oh, oh we can't tell right. both. You're right. They <laughs> all want time both. for questions if we tell both. Um, we have, all right. All right well, actually, what, we'll take some questions and we'll go okay. back to the customer service okay. stories. Or no, I'm yeah, done yeah. with this. I'm well, it'll take Nobody probably ten to minutes to tell both. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. No. Okay. So. Um, all right. So the. Uh, and this was actually something, it happened a few years ago, and we, we did, and then, and then somehow it got, well, I'll tell the story first. So basically what happened was we, um, one of the kind of secrets to uh, Zappos, if you're a customer, is that if you order a pair of shoes, let's say you're size eight, and then you need to exchange it for an eight and a half, if you call our 1-800 number, we'll actually send you out the replacement pair before we, We'll just overnight it to you so you get it the next day before we get your return back. And so what we do is we ask customers, and, and we don't advertise this at all, but we ask customers uh, to just send it back to us within two weeks. And most of them send it back you know, pretty within, within one week or less. And, and then if we don't get it back within two weeks, then we have a team that follows up and just as a reminder and so on. So we had someone that uh, hadn't returned the sh the uh, original, the original pair within two weeks. We called them up, and uh, she said, "Oh, I apologize. Uh, you know, completely slipped my mind because uh, her mom had just passed away, and and so she was busy with all the funeral stuff. And you know, returning shoes was, I'm sure, Not the last thing on, on on her mind. So uh, the rep, uh, you know." said, oh, take your time, apologize and, you know, for interrupting her, and, and don't worry about it. Just you know, take care of what you need to take care of, and then uh, I'll just put special notes in. And then the rep took, upon, took it upon herself to send flowers to um, the, the woman to show our condolences as a company, which we don't have a process or procedure for, uh, but it was something the rep just felt was the right thing to do. And the woman was so touched that a company would actually care to do that, that um, you know, at the funeral a few days later, she told the 40 or 50 people that were at that funeral what, what had happened. And so not only is she a customer for life, but so are all the 40 and 50 friends that were there. And you know, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't even know about this in, internally, but we empower our reps to really just do what they feel is right. And it just so happened that this woman happened to be a blogger, and uh, wrote wrote about it. And then it got picked up by Consumerist, uh, which is a pretty high traffic website. And then it just kind of spread like wildfire. But it was, and, and actually, I think it got picked up six months afterwards. So, so 
but anyways, it's just one an example of one of those things that we can't, you know, plan for that type of PR, but it ended up being really good. You know, for the company. But it goes back to hiring the right people and empowering them yeah, and, to... And making sure everyone understands the long-term vision of the company. And then most right. of the stuff takes care of itself. This is just one story and we get, you know, literally we're creating thousands of these stories every single day. And, um, and then the pizza story is I, a has similar situation. It <laughs> uh, has a little... Well, so this was a, uh, in Santa Monica, uh, a few years ago at a Skechers conference I was speaking at and it had been a long, Skechers is one of our brands, it had been a long day and then uh, at the end of the day a few of us decided to go bar hopping in this Santa Monica area and which I'd never been, been to before and so uh, I think there were three of us from Zappos and three people from Skechers and went to the first bar and uh, someone ordered a round of drinks, it had been a long day and then someone else ordered a round of shots so we took the shots and took the drinks, drank the drinks, and then moved on to the second bar. And at the second bar, someone else ordered a round of drinks to pay back for the first round of drinks, and then someone else ordered a second round of <laughs> shots to pay back for the first round of shots. And um, you can't waste alcohol, so we finished <laughs> the shot and the drink. And then we went to the third bar and uh, ordered Actually, I'm unclear how many shots or drinks we had <laughs> after that, but what I do know is we went from bar to bar and last call in California, I guess it's 2 a.m., and eventually lights went on, uh, they stopped serving alcohol, and so we all started walking back to the hotel, and one of the girls from Skechers uh, started talking about this pepperoni pizza that she had seen on the room service menu, and uh, she asked if we wanted to go in on it, and he said, sure. And so she was all excited and was like, oh, I cannot wait till I get back to the hotel room and order the pepperoni pizza. I saw it before we left. It was on page 17, the second item. <laughs> and, but I know when it arrives, it's going to be hot. I don't want to burn the roof of my mouth, so I'm going to blow on it and just take in the smell at first. And I'm so excited about this pepperoni pizza. And uh, anyway, she just kept going on. And, and <laughs> It was only a five-minute walk, but it seemed much longer than that because she would not stop <laughs> talking about this pepperoni pizza. So finally, we get to the hotel room, and uh, she calls room service, super excited, and then 10 seconds later, hangs up the phone all quiet and dejected, and we ask her, what's wrong? And she said, the hotel doesn't serve hot food after 11 p.m., and she she seemed really sad, and <laughs> so um, you know, I, you know, in the book I talk about how in college I ran a pizza business, and so uh, to try to cheer her up, I say, did you know in college I used to make pepperoni pizza? And she looks at me and is like, that's so not helpful right now. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, in our slightly inebriated state, the the three of us from Zappos say, oh, call Zappos, call Zappos. We're all about the best customer service. And in our state of mind, we thought that really was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> and so um, she didn't think it was that funny, but she um, put, it on, put the phone on speakerphone and called our 1-800 number. And the rep answered, thanks for calling Zappos. How can I help you? And she said, oh, thank goodness you answered. I'm in Santa Monica right now. I know it's 3 AM. And you know we've been we've had a few drinks, but I've been craving this pepperoni pizza all night, and you know, I'm looking at it right now. It's on page 17, the second item, and you know really want a pepperoni pizza right now. But uh, they don't serve hot food after 11 p.m. What kind of hotel does not serve hot food after 11 p.m.? <laughs> and well, first there was an awkward silence, and then <laughs> the rep said, "You know, you called." Zappos, right? Like, we sell shoes, we sell clothes, but we don't sell pizza yet. And uh, she said, I know, but I heard you're all about the best customer service. And so the rep said, okay, hold on. And uh, put us on hold and uh, came back two minutes later, listing the five closest places in the Santa Monica area that are still open and delivering pizza at that hour. <laughs> and so I hesitate a little to tell the story because I don't want all of you to start calling <laughs> Zappos and ordering pizza, but you know, clearly we don't have a process or a procedure for 
late night drunk pizza orders. <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it just, it, I just think it's a fun story to show that if you get the culture right and make sure everyone understands the long-term vision of the company, then you know, delivering great customer service or uh, you know, building your brand one phone call at a time, stories like this, which you know, that Skechers girl has now told lots of people and uh, just happens naturally on its own. So it's all about the culture. I'm sure everyone has many questions. I think we've got a little bit of time left now. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your experiences with us today. My question relates to building your culture. You mentioned hiring people who you essentially want to go have a beer with, right? How do you balance that with having some diversity of thought? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great, I think part of it, is, uh, and there's definitely a danger on, in that if you, uh, it depends on what your core values are. And so for us, I think the way we address it is by building, uh, being uh, creative, being open-minded, uh, specifically that, that word, and then also embracing and driving change uh, as one of our core values. And I think having those two, um, and then to a certain degree also be humble. So having those three things as part of our core values helps address that situation because then it's not this is the way we've always you don't get into that trap of this is the way we've always done it and therefore everyone needs to think the same, the same way we always encourage new ideas and even if it's some if it's something that we used to do always by having embrace and drive change as part of our culture you don't get stuck into kind of that single Thing. But I think if we didn't have those, that's, that would definitely be, be a danger. Thank you for your presentation today. <clears throat> I'm curious, anecdotally, I know a lot of people who will order a half a dozen pairs of shoes knowing that they're only going to keep one or two. So I'm, because of the easy return policy at Zappos. So I am curious if you actually have, statistically, a higher percentage of customers who do that and if so, then how have you compensated for that? Because that's something other companies fear, having to have that you know, much higher inventory because of that kind of a policy. So if it's true, how do you compensate for yeah. it? Yeah, so uh, I have two answers for that. One is that uh, you know, return, our return, average return rate is probably somewhere between 30 and 40%, depending on what, what the brand is. But what we found is that customers that return, say, 40%, actually end up spending uh, more dollars than customers that return 0% because mm. they just start feeling more comfortable with the process, are willing to try new brands, new styles, and so on. And so we actually end up making more money even though their return rate is higher. And our goal is actually not to um, reduce return rates, but really to get customers to think of, re don't think of returns as a bad thing. It's just part, that back and forth is just part of the service, just like with Netflix. The, shipping of DVDs back for this part of the service. Uh, you know, there does get to some point where, I don't know what the exact number is, but if you're returning 99% of what you order, I'm sure we're losing money on that customer. But on the flip side, you know, that one customer, you know, looking, look, looked at in a vacuum, may be a money loser, but you just told me anecdotally, you know of people that do this, and you know, that's a form of word of mouth, right? And, and so we just view that as an advertising or marketing cost. Tony, I'm an executive recruiter and I really enjoyed the stories about hiring. And I have 38 pairs of shoes, quite frankly. <laughs> <clears throat> My question for you is, uh, it's difficult to sustain a culture. And I'm wondering what kinds of things you do to reinforce in the areas of training and sustaining uh, your cultural values and actually allow them to, to grow and develop. Uh, perhaps maybe that list may be different uh, five years from now. What kinds of things are you doing in that area? Yeah, so uh, you know, most large companies, as they get bigger, the culture goes downhill. And not only do we want to prevent that from happening, but we actually want it to scale and get stronger and stronger as we grow. And the only way that can happen is if, uh, I, I'm only one, one person, and so the only way that can happen is if each and every employee views as part of his or her job description uh, the responsibility to 
live in, inspire the culture in, in others. And, and that's the only way it can scale. And, and so that, that's our biggest challenge and, and the thing that we're most um, mindful of when we hire people and make sure that they understand. In fact, we have a document that lists the 10 core values. And um, actually, it's in the book as well, uh, but then goes into each in a lot more detail. And then you know, during the, uh, you know, the first few days of joining a company, when you're signing all these forms, one of the documents is actually, I understand that this is part of my job description and, and responsibility. Um, and I guess the way, the analogy I would use is, um, like, I don't know if you've seen, like, on the Discovery Channel, sometimes, like, over the, in Africa or something, there's 50,000 birds, all, like, a giant flock all flying in, in unison. And there really isn't a, um, a lead bird. The, the, basically, they all live by, uh, or fly by very simple rules, which is, you know, stay this many, inches from the bird on the right, this many inches from the bird on the left. And you know, there's three or four very basic rules that, uh, because they all have the same DNA, you know, if you take a step back, actually, the whole thing looks like almost like another unified organism. And so I would view our core values as kind of the equivalent of, like, if we can make sure we hire employees whose personal values match our corporate core values, like that's basically you know the DNA, and, and just follow these very, make sure, follow, but make sure we're religious about following these ten very uh, simple core values. Then uh, you can take a st step back and uh, just like you can get fifty thousand birds to seem to move in unison, uh, same thing with an organization, and and so that's kind of the vision. But if we need to make sure that every single employee actually lives those values the same way we, you know, the birds need to make sure that they all have the same uh, rules for how far apart to stay away from each other. Don't you pay people to go away? Uh, we do. Um, at the end, we have a four-week training program uh, for every employee when they start in our headquarters. And it doesn't matter what position, you go through the exact same training. During that four weeks, we go over company history, the importance of uh, company culture, our philosophy about customer service, and you're actually on the phone for two weeks taking calls from customers. So that four weeks is an additional, uh, part of it is to make sure um, that everyone, it's really to drive in our core values, not so much in terms of memorization, but more just in uh, making sure that, yeah, just getting people culturally um, integrated into the company. But it's also really an extended four-week uh, interview as well, because it's pretty hard to fake your, your way th for, through four weeks. And at the end of the first week, we offer everyone, uh, we make an offer to everyone, and the offer is to, that will pay them for the time they spent training, plus a bonus of $2,000. Actually, it's $3,000 now to quit and leave the company. And that's a standing offer through the end of the training. And then we extend it a bit more beyond that. And starting pay in. Las Vegas for a call center rep is $11 an hour. So it's a pretty significant amount of money. And the original reason we did that was because we didn't want employees that were there just for a paycheck. We want, really want employees that believe in the long-term vision of the company and really feel like this is a company whose culture they want to be a part of and contribute to. And so you know, that process also helps build our culture. And, and actually, the biggest benefit is, so about 2 or 3% of people end up taking the offer. Um, but the biggest benefit, which we were surprised by, is actually from the people that don't take the offer. Because they still have to go home and talk to their friends and family and ask themselves, is this a company that I really believe in uh, so much that I'm willing to walk away from an easy $3,000? And when they decide to turn down the offer, they, when they're back in the office on Monday, they're that much more committed and engaged. And uh, that's another way we help build our culture. I just finished business school, and throughout business school and throughout my life, I've been told, you have to do what you love, you have to do what you love. And it seems that you mostly like how you do what you do, as opposed to what. Because admittedly, you only had one pair of shoes for many years, until recently. So what percentage do you, of importance would you advise budding entrepreneurs to place on the what as opposed to the how? Uh, well, I, I guess for me, it's, you know, we're, 
if it was just about selling shoes, then I, I, yeah, that's not something I'm passionate about. But what I am passionate about is uh, customer service and company culture. And so to me, those are actually the what's. I completely agree that you should you know, figure out what you'd be so passionate about doing that you'd be happy doing it for 10 years, even if you didn't make any money from it. And that's what you should be doing. And, uh, and kind of the ironic thing is, I think if you actually do that, you'll end up making more money than you otherwise would because that passion is going to rub off on employees and uh, vendors you work with and customers and, and so on. And uh, we found the same thing at, at Zappos. We originally started out just being about shoes. And then it wasn't until three or four years into it, we sat around and asked ourselves, what do we really want to be about? What do we want to stand for? And that's when we decided we want to build the Zappos brand about the very best customer service. And when that happened, uh, suddenly employees were a lot more passionate and engaged. And when customers called, they could sense the person on the other end of the phone wasn't there just for a paycheck, and vendors would come and stay longer and, and visit more frequently because the enthusiasm rubbed off to them. And all of those things had this um, like multiplicative snowball effect that really uh, drove a lot of our growth over the years. Um, yeah, so, so we're hoping 10 years from now that people won't even realize that we started out selling shoes online. And we actually sell you know, clothing, beauty products, um, even housewares and kitchenwares, and we've had customers uh, email us and ask us if we would please start an airline or run the IRS. And so <laughs> we're, uh, we're not going to do any of those things this year, but uh, 20 or 30 years from now, I wouldn't rule out a Zappos Airlines. That's just about the very best customer service. So kind of like Virgin is in a whole bunch of different business, music airlines and so on, uh, but the Virgin brand is more about being hip and cool, whereas we just want the Zappos brand to be about the very best customer service. And so it's the service. Internally, we have a saying, we're a service company that just happens to sell shoes. So for me, the customer service part is what I'm passionate about. And to me, that's, I guess, both the, the what and the how. But what you won't be selling is earthworms, I pretty much uh, venture to get. Maybe. Maybe one day. <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank for you coming. very much.